Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Cho, CNBC anchor. I'd like to welcome you here today. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. Also, let me extend a warm welcome to, to stakeholders here at WEF, participants and delegates. We have been handed one of the most exciting topics here at the World Economic Forum as we talk about this great equaliser that AI could be. We have a 45-minute debate just to remind you that this session is being live streamed, but also we're live on the CNBC with this conversation this afternoon. I'd also urge you to get involved through the social media platforms just to remind you that the hashtag is WEF24. Just to contextualize how we ended up here, last year I moderated a panel on cybersecurity with the likes of Microsoft, Cisco and others. And we were debating what the impact of chat GPT would be. It was just weeks after the first Gen I rendition had taken the world by storm. I think we now know that AI is going to impact just about every sector and country across the world. So it's just phenomenal, the amount of acceleration we've seen in 12 months. I want to talk about a very visible example that we've seen, and from this is from the CNBC lens. The uneven stock market ret returns we've witnessed on Wall Street in 2023, investors piling into AI stocks, just seven names, for instance, uh, the bulk of US stock market returns last year. One of those companies represented here today. The question is whether we see more disruption from AI and just who benefits in the next phase. It's clear there are, there are consequences for the pace of development in sectors and regional economies in a multipolar world. So what does it take to ensure equal access to AI? Now, on that note, let me introduce you to our panelists today. Han Duxu, Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea. Paula Ingebeer, Minister of Information, Communication, Technology and Innovation of Rwanda, young global leader. Abdullah al Shawa, who is the Minister of Communications and Information Technology of Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Ruth Porat, President and Chief Investment Officer, Chief Financial Officer, Google. Amandeep Singh Gill, United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. Thank you very much for joining us today. Prime Minister, if I can start with you. The AI discussion is often framed around the US versus China. Yet South Korea has huge advancements in this space, deep investments by local companies from Samsung to LG Electronics to top internet companies like Kakao and Neva, Telecoms, SK and KT. What does the potential hold for South Korea around AI in 2024? I think that uh, we should uh, recollect what was the mood last year. AI experts last year warned that uh, through only one line statement that mitigating the risk of ex extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside pandemics and nuclear warfare. But we still ask whether AI can be the great equalizer. Korea, if I may judge in advance, AI can be a great equalizer with some caveats. The first thing is how can we make our AI literacy widely uh, you know, available within Korea as well as outside Korea, some countries where Korean can can help. So in Korea, we believe about 2,000 uh, AI companies are actually engaged in these operations. And big companies, of course, are there. But uh, they are, if I may say, they are actually fine-tuning and customizing uh, <coughs> these you know, big models of AI to their specific purposes, like healthcare, electronic commerce, and possibly uh, to the climate change. That's the directions we are going, rather than totally generating a new breakthrough frontier AI, we, based on this kind of a very big frontier AI, 
we would like to make them uh, more usable and better adaptable to the need that human beings have. Prime Minister, do you think South, South Korea will be an AI winner? I, uh, I, I believe so, because uh, in digitalization, Korea is one of the countries that stands at the forefront. Minister, let me turn to you. Most of the global South is still working on digital adoption. Rwanda itself turned to the World Bank financing in recent years to support digital transformation. And you've had help from South Korea Telecom on 4G connectivity. We're not even talking about faster 5G at this stage. Is AI more of a challenge for Rwanda over the next 12 months than an opportunity? I think AI is more an opportunity, and you see it mostly around our national AI policy and strategy that we launched last year, which in many ways um, you know, spells out our ambitions as a country uh, to build the AI capabilities that we need as a country, but also not just build the capabilities, think about the applications of AI that are going to drive productivity, that are going to contribute um, uh, to GDP. One of the, as we were developing our policy and strategy, we also had to look at what could be the economic impact of you know, leveraging AI and deploying it in the different clusters of the economy. And what we saw was a contribution of up to 6% of GDP, even with the current status quo. And so we're already looking at agriculture ranking high in terms of you know, the economic impact that could happen, whether we're building AI models that will support with early warning systems for farmers, healthcare, where we're looking at you know, large language models that use the local language to support community health workers that are the frontline um, you know, workers that are supporting you know, communities. And so um, for us, it's not a question of, do we first focus on you know, fixing the challenges around digital adoption before we think more futuristically looking at AI. I think it's a combination of doing both at the same time and figuring out um, how do you not play catch up. I think you ask a great question and maybe Amandeep may have to uh, expand on that. I know that there are reports that are already out that show that the global south is more optimistic about AI adoption than the north. And that could be you know, a question of we have a very youthful population. They are the ones that are building these solutions, but they're also going to be the consumers of many of these solutions. And so there's an opportunity there that we cannot miss by waiting to first close on the gap around digital adoption, but rather taking it in parallel. Minister, let me turn to you. PwC crunched some numbers last year predicting artificial intelligence will contribute $135 billion to the Saudi economy in 2030, making the kingdom the biggest beneficiary of the technology in the Middle East. Microsoft's Nadella also believes AI can drive your nation's fortunes. How will AI propel the Saudi economy to a longer term 2030 vision thanks to AI advancements in your country? Thank you, Karen. And I couldn't agree more with His Excellency the Prime Minister and Her Excellency Paula that generative AI is, is a general purpose technology is definitely going to transform humanity as we know it today. Where if you look at the tipping point where we're crossing from the B2C use cases to a general purpose technology that diffuses across industries, this is where we can reap the fruits. And within the Saudi context, we take huge pride. If you look at the secret sauce today for leadership in generative AI, you need Gen AI leadership and His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman is very bullish about it. Secondly, you need industry expertise and an ecosystem approach. And hands down, I have the pleasure of working with all of my colleagues uh, within this panel. And if there's one story that is near and dear to my heart that I would like to share with you that exemplifies the momentum that is happening today is in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And this story has to do with genetic diseases. And the reason why it's, it's so close to my heart, I actually lost my eldest sister to a genetic disease. And this particular disease that I'm going to share with you is called sickle cell disease, which is all about your red blood cells transforming into a crescent, into a crescent that basically blocks vessels. This could affect limbs. This actually affects the global south in Africa, 75%. And with generative AI in partnership with Google, we have launched Google Cloud Node last August, and a startup called Nanopalm which actually leverage generative AI to do drug formulation instead of 10 to 15 years, a drug that historically used to cost $3 million, today with $300,000,
in less than two years, leveraging large language models to correlate proteins and enzymes with nanorobots that inserted through your skin can penetrate the walls of cells and can do genetic editing to prevent those genetic diseases. There's a trial right now in the National Guard Hospital in Riyadh where 15 patients are praying for such a solution. This could not be possible without generative AI and without this ecosystem approach in partnership with all of you. Minister, thank you. Ruth, let me come to you. I mentioned the stock market game. And your parent company, Alphabet, has seen its stock up 54-odd percent in the last 12 months. The AI winner story is there. Your, your CEO has promised that we will see multi a modal from Google in uh, coming months. That means operating with information across words, pictures, video and sound. You, more than anyone else in this room, is at the forefront of the AI revolution. So just how widely will that revolution be felt in 2024? Will it be seen in more than just seven so-called magnificent stocks? So we are very excited about the implication for AI globally. And I love the title of this, this discussion we're having here today because it really goes to the heart of it, can it be the great equalizer? So yes, we are investing meaningfully in AI and have been doing so for quite some time. And in fact, we're describing it as though it's new, but AI has been in our products for over a decade and billions of people are using AI across all sorts of products. When you search, for example, in photos for a family member, that's AI. Anyone who's traveling in language translation is AI. It's across all the work we're doing in cloud. So we are building on a decade of AI being included within um, product. But what is so exciting sitting where we are today are the types of applications that can really transform lives, can make such a difference. So we've already heard about health. I think health is one of the most important and exciting areas. Because think about diagnosis and what that is. That, in particular, you benefit from <coughs> leveraging many, many scans. So as an example, one that's near and dear to my heart, one in seven women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm one of those. I've had breast cancer twice. And when I got to Google, we had an early, we had a breakthrough in what is called early detection of metastatic cancer. So I called my oncologist, we've talked about this, I called my oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I think it's one of the best, if not the best, cancer care center. I know I was one of the lucky ones. And I said, how important is this? And his answer was, you cannot democratize healthcare without AI, because now any doctor anywhere around the globe is leveraging mi the million scans that we've seen and is therefore operating at the highest level. We're doing it in other parts of, of cancer. We're doing it with diabetic retinopathy, but we're, it, it, which is um, blindness that comes from diabetes affecting hundreds of millions of people on the globe. This is extraordinary, and it's here today. It's not something that's coming later. And it's true across a number of different areas. So for example, food security, major issue that we talk about appropriately quite a bit at Davos Well, back to your point, with AI, we can improve the yield on crops. Not only great for the farmers, but addresses a critical pain point on the globe. On climate change, we're doing a lot of work around um, uh, adaptation and, and really crisis management. So fires, flooding, obviously a major issue. 250 million people on the globe are affected by flooding. With Google AI, we've now created the capability to have seven days early warning, getting people out of harm's way. So what gets us really excited is that yes, it's across our products, and as you asked in your question, this is something that across any industry, any government leader here, it's the better provisioning of product, it's efficiencies that you can get, and very importantly to the theme of our conversation here, it has the potential to be the great equalizer. Ruth, thank you. Uh, Secretary General, as we race towards 2030 and achieving the UN's SDGs, what advancements are possible thanks to AI that can tackle these 17 goals around poverty, education, better infrastructure and sustainable growth? Right. Uh, I, I want to take a slightly different angle uh, from uh, my fellow panellists on this. Uh, I think 2024 will see uh, a lot more money being made from AI by uh, a few companies, uh, but the jury is still out on how and in what manner AI can change the direction 
uh, of progress on the sustainable development goals. So on current trends, the answer is no. AI will not be the great equalizer. AI will not rescue the SDGs. Uh, but if we want to get to that point where AI can be the great equalizer, can make an impact on health, on agriculture, food security, in other areas, critical areas of the SDGs, we would need much more deliberate effort. It's not going to happen automatically. And six to seven are not going to do it. Maybe seven million, 70 million innovators from around the world uh, working with AI, working with data uh, can do this. So we need to enlarge the opportunity space in 2024. We need to put in place good governance so that uh, we earn the trust of the users, um, the public at large. Uh, we address some of the misuses, the risks that are clearly out there, uh, misinformation, disinformation, exclusion of certain communities, uh, surveillance, whether it is by governments or by companies, uh, which impacts on uh, individual freedoms, fundamental rights. So without doing that, there's not going to be. Um, if you look at the top countries in AI today, there's not a single country from Africa in the top 50 in terms of research output. So how do we change that unless we invest more in the human resource, in the digital economy, in connectivity, making sure data flows build up. How are you going to train the models if you don't have the right data flows? Um, and we need to build more cross-disciplinary expertise across health and artificial intelligence. So these are the issues that need to be tackled if we want to see progress on the SDGs. Prime Minister, let me come back to you on the governance point, because from Bletchley Park in the UK, the former home to World War II codebreakers, the second AI safety summit will be staged in your country this year. What progress are you hoping to make on things such as AI inclusion? Well, uh, first of all, the leaders uh, that gathered at the first summit is that uh, there are things and homeworks that we should do to make AI the great uh, equalizer. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, people should be AI literate and digital literate. So uh, Korea announced some of the digital bill of rights. Uh, that includes some principles of fairness, solidarity, and things like that. So in terms of solidarity, uh, we are going out to and, and uh, made, made the projects with ASEAN, the flagship projects, uh, which will help the transforming the digitalization works and processes uh, in some of the countries in ASEAN uh, to be more uh, digitally uh, not le uh, to be left out. And our second summit that will be held around May, and we also <coughs> you know, called for uh, you know, global uh, digital forum, uh, which will be held back to back uh, with the second uh, you know, the safety summit. Uh, that is we would like to minimize the downside and maximize the upside, the potential and possibilities of AI. And so on the basis of, of the results of the first summit, uh, we will uh, review uh, some of the things that we should do in the future to make our AI the real uh, you know, global uh, great stabilizer. And that will start from making all the people that will be subject to these AI breakthroughs to, f to fully understand and utilize this uh, di digital breakthrough, uh, you know, including AI. And uh, Korea will do its, its uh, best efforts in making this AI the real global uh, great stabilizer in domestic education and training and also going out with other uh, other people and country uh, who can be liable to 
the possibility of being left out to help them uh, to utilize this uh, great phenomenon and transformation in the world called AI. Prime Minister, but there are access issues and South Korea, a US ally, has witnessed firsthand the impact of a multipolar world when it comes to technology. Uh, your companies recently, in uh, November, South Korean companies <coughs> can still operate fabrication facilities in China. But does an AI chip war threaten equal access to the hardware first, let alone collaboration on, on data sharing? Do we need to see AI stay out of trade policy? I think uh, the, the global world and all the countries should really be working very hard with relevant agencies and relevant forums that uh, trade matters, of course, in making AI the real uh, great stabilizer. We should make more the, the, the trade in AI-related products and services to be uh, more uh, you know, open to the people and to the country who are quite liable to be left out. Minister, same question to you in a way. Saudi Arabia has been reliant on US technology to build out your AI capabilities. Are trade barriers and heightened geopolitical risks getting in the way of AI being the great equalizer? First of all, if we recognize today, and all of us as a panelist, that generative AI is a general purpose technology, similar to the internet, to the steam engine or electricity, we can't prevent this from proliferating and giving this access to everybody. So we can't leave anybody behind in this era. But going back to your question, the kingdom has been very consistent. We're pro-innovation, pro-partnership, and we took a huge pride in our partnership, for example, with the US and also with South Korea and Rwanda and the UN, in which the kingdom has grown since the launch of Vision 2030 in terms of our cloud, GPU, and AI capacity tremendously. We've attracted more than $6.2 billion. We, we remain consistent. We have a build, partner, and acquire strategy. And right now, thanks to folks like uh, Google and, and your peers within the industry, we're having plenty of access to those technologies. So you're not worried about the US Chips Act and how it imp impacts China, for instance? What I would recommend is that we work closely with our partners. If they have concerns on technology leakage, similar to, for example, the kingdom have just acquired Lucid as, a, as an EV. The last thing we want is patent or technology leakage. And if it's necessary to put restrictions around that, we're all for it. So again, this is a general purpose technology. We should leave no one behind. But if there's concerns about technological leakage, we'll be more than happy, all of us, to collaborate with our alliance partners to make sure that we restrict access to those potential areas of leakage. Minister, can I come to you? Because uh, China and India have effectively bankrolled the lion's share of investment in your country in recent years. Where does this leave you in terms of access to hardware, access to data, let alone building out the right digital workforce? So maybe starting with data. Um, when it comes to access to data, we have a lot of data. I mean, we're a country that for the last uh, 18 years has gone big in terms of digitizing uh, different uh, functions and services. Most of our government services are online. So in many ways, um, we do have a lot of data. And this, for us, is an opportunity uh, to go back and then build the right models that will analyze and synthesize this data and even generate insights. And we're already doing that in different uh, sectors. When it comes to hardware, again, I think there are challenges that come with the region as a whole um, in terms of probably not even having the, that kind of capacity on the continent. But in many ways, this is where, when we talk about uh, partnerships and collaboration, this is where it comes in very handy. And so uh, no one can develop as an island on their own. And so partnerships are very critical for some of these ambitions that we have as a country or even as a continent. But can you partner with everyone or do you have to pick a side? Well, we don't have to pick a side. I think, one, we, we start by identifying what are the needs, what are the needs that we have, whether it's as a country or as a continent. I'm speaking in this particular case as a country. So based on our needs, then we'll figure out who are the best-in-class partners that we can reach out to. When I look at what we are doing in AI, whether it's Saudi Arabia, uh, whether it's UAE and many other countries, Singapore as well, are countries that we've already been very intentional about partnering with because we see what they're already doing and we feel like there are lessons that we can learn from that. And so it's not a question of just choosing partners, but we choose them best on where are our needs and what value are they bringing to the table for us. Secretary General, to you, you've seen firsthand how the Global South has dealt with the consequences of a multipolar world. 
One CEO, and this was a European CEO, said to me, look, there could be productivity gains for some of the lower income countries in the global south thanks to AI because you've seen the, the increasingly regionalization of supply chains. This can close the gap on the skill set. But then there's a big question of who pays for it. So just weigh in on some of the challenges. Yes, I think the foundations are lacking in, uh, in most countries. Some of the pioneers, uh, Rwanda is an example, uh, India, Bangladesh, and China, of course, is uh, one of the biggest examples. In They've leveraged the digital transformation. They've built the foundation. And now they are in a position to take advantage of the AI opportunity. For most, that's not the case. Uh, so they would need to build up the foundations around data, human resource, uh, compute capacity, use cases that build up trust, they need to put in place data protection frameworks uh, uh, that allow innovation to happen uh, uh, responsibly. Uh, so I see interesting examples. In, I'm not a pessimist about uh, digital technology, uh, and I've worked in the digital health and AI in health space, seen very interesting use cases. But today, if you ask me, if I'm a country, uh, developing country, I have to put some money somewhere, I would rather put it in digital public infrastructure to reinforce financial inclusion. I'd rather put it in education, especially of girls and women. It'll give me much more return uh, without, without keeping my eyes off the AI equation. So I need to build up the foundation while putting my money on the digital transformation aspects that are within grasp. That's where you'll get maximum returns for the SDGs. As, we, as we've seen in India, uh, four to five decades uh, worth of progress on financial inclusion accelerated uh, and made possible in seven to eight years by leveraging digital technologies. AI yeah, use cases are emerging, financial risk, financial fraud, but we need to wait and see. Ruth, technology is meant to democratize everything. But what we've seen over the past decade or so is that there's a digital divide to the point where this has ended up on the UN's SDGs. How do we ensure that AI simply isn't just another opportunity for developed Western nations and companies like yours? There's been a lot of discussion on this panel with which I completely agree. We have the opportunity ahead of us to address pain points, to address the SDGs. That doesn't mean that they're within our grasp if we don't deal with mitigating the downside and extending connectivity. And so I, I think there are a number of points that are deeply substantive that need to be addressed if we're gonna benefit globally from the reality of AI. One, it's everything around the guardrails to make it safe. Mm -hmm. It's everything from cyber, cybersecurity in an AI world to avoid the bad guys from getting in. It's watermarking so that you know about authenticity. It's transparency. It's quality of information. So there's a whole body of substantive work that's absolutely critical. The second, more to your question, is connectivity. A third of the globe is still not online. And so we're very proud at Google. We're an important part of that infrastructure. We're most certainly not all of it, and there's an entire ecosystem that needs to be built, but we have um, built out about a quarter of the, the infrastructure needed to power the internet through subsea cables, the data center network. And every time we build a branch and we can then take a node off and connect another country, the, the response is this is a contributor to economic growth and gives us the opportunity, frankly, to go exactly where Larry um, Page and Sergey Brin started with this company, which is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. Well, you can't be universally accessible and useful if you don't have connectivity, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, to ensure connectivity. And then the last point is there is going to be a transition. A lot of the analysis says that in this transition, there will be more jobs created than lost, which is interesting on av for the averages, but it's not a specific answer to the individual. And so how do you deal with transition? We need workforce skilling. We're doing a lot of work at Google through something called Grow with Google. But again, this is about us working with other companies, public and private sector. You need that education component of it and the reskilling component. Without these guardrails across the board, we can't realize the potential upside. And I started in your first question because it's so extraordinary to the upside that we really should motivate us to come together to deal with what is this downside guardrail protection. But Ruth, what is the direct role of your company, one of the largest companies on the planet to do more this time round? Because some shareholders, some uh, Republicans would say, 
there's a fiduciary duty for Google to maximize its AI profits in this journey, not to focus on tech for good. What would you say to that? I would say that if what you're trying to do is build a healthy business that creates consistent value over the long term, you need to be able to be building out, as we are, the infrastructure that connects the globe, that delivers services to the globe. Um, it, it is, it's not mutually exclusive. It's a false choice question. AI as an equalizer has the potential to equalize companies. For a long time, we've been talking about the Google moat. Is there a chance that that moat gets disrupted thanks to AI? Well, I think what's key here is we're seeing a lot of innovation around the globe, which is very exciting, much of which we're proud to be working with uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, and the volume of investment that we've made in the technical infrastructure really enables them to piggyback on it. It's the data center analytics um, and work that we've done, the cybersecurity that keeps them safe, that is an accelerant. So I think that's one important part around the, the innovation ecosystem. The other is that AI should benefit every industry. It's a, it's a contributor to revenue acceleration, to expense, um, expense management, and so winners and losers in, across industry around the globe, I think, can be gauged by the extent to which you leverage this technology that's here. And so what we're also looking to do is be an extraordinary partner across industries as people are looking to leverage whatever the investments that are made. Mm -hmm. Minister Alshara, can I come back to you? Saudi Arabia was one of the 28 countries that signed the Bletchley Declaration around the safe development and use of AI. Yet on the human rights tracker, safety from the state scores low, sub five out of 10. What would you say to those who fear that ethics in Saudi Arabia will take a back seat to rapid AI advancement to harness profits? I'd say let's stick to the facts. We're at Davos, we're talking about rebuilding trust. The World Economic Forum would not name the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as the number one digital riser two years in a row, specifically around files like women empowerment and tech, where we have jumped from 7% to 35%, beating the EU average, the Silicon Valley average, and even the G20 average. We also have a particular kind of interest in women entrepreneurship. Riyadh right now is the fifth largest capital when it comes to women, you know, entrepreneurship. These are the kind of facts that we need to stick to to make sure that we respond. We take huge pride in what we're doing, and we're going to stay the course in empowering people, focusing on women and youth, safeguarding the planet as we're jumping from green photons to electrons to hydrogen, and shape new frontiers in partnership with all of you. Minister Ngabir, your government has recently built out a digital platform. There was a wide-scale applause for the endeavor, but also some criticism about the level of access. Mm -hmm. Just talk us through that access issue to ensure those who are not digitally savvy can actually participate in AI in future. Mm -hmm. Very good question. I think a couple of things. Um, yes, we have the government platform uh, through which almost all, every government service is provided, but the issue of access is multi-pronged. Um, so the reality is that when you look at our, and thanks to the partnership that we have uh, with South Korea, we've been able to roll out 97% population coverage of the 4G network. What that means is that you have 97% of our population that at least lives in a place that is very well covered. Does that mean that they're using it? The question is no, and that is where the access problem stems from. And so we did a bit of analysis, and this is something that most countries that are grappling with the access problem uh, you know, share in common. It's the cost uh, affordability, which is really around the cost of devices and cost of service that has been um, one of the reasons why we don't see the same number of people that have coverage that are actually meaningfully using or benefiting from uh, this connectivity infrastructure directly. The second one is digital literacy, which you tackled, and those are the two barriers that we see. So how have we solved for them? One, we've created a number of programs, and one of them is the Digital Ambassadors Program that goes out to the communities with the target rural communities to train them on basic digital literacy skills. So an example is we'll go out and train them on, here is a platform where you can self-sub and get a service. You don't need to go through an agent to get a service if you have a device. Two is to think about device financing um, models that unlock the affordability issue. Now you can imagine um, for a smartphone, for one to be able to access this platform, they needed a smartphone. And our smartphone penetration was at about 23%. 
And the biggest challenge for many of the people was affordability. You needed to pay upfront the full value of the smartphone to be able to access, to, to own one and access the smartphone. <coughs> So what we did recently, which was very interesting with uh, support of one of the operators, was to create a model where um, we created pre uh, repayment plans and were able to give um, support citizens to get a smartphone at $16 and pay just a dollar for one GB of data every day for 30 days, unlimited calls and unlimited SMS. And so these are some of the many ways that we're trying to solve for the access problem, tackling affordability and digital literacy. And we're very optimistic that in the next three years, at least every citizen will have this level of access that allows them to then benefit directly. Secretary General, I want to turn to education, the role of training. This has been key in so many areas. And as we talk about AI, how do poor nations think about building an AI skill set in their country? Right. So this will have to start early. Uh, and it's not only about STEM education. It's also about uh, cross-disciplinary expertise, as I mentioned before. For example, in undergrad classes in medical schools, you would have to bring in uh, appreciation of data science, uh, actually maybe one semester, one full year of working with data science. Uh, and in engineering uh, schools, you would have to bring in medical data, medical images, so that people can learn to work across these uh, disciplines. You would also need a massive education effort for public officials uh, in terms of picking what are the wise use cases, what are the kind of guardrails we need around them, uh, legislators in terms of legislating uh, the data protection frameworks and other kind of aspects of, uh, of governance. So it's a whole of society effort. AI is in many ways, I, I think the jury is still out on some of the benefits and the, uh, the downside, but it's a game changer. It's going to perhaps rewire the software of our institutions, political, social, economic. We need to prepare our societies for that. It's going to have some unpredictable effects in societal relationships, uh, human well-being. So again, you know, this requires not just technical education, um, uh, expertise in AI modeling or data science. It also requires greater uh, investments in behavioral science and the ethics of AI and those kind of other uh, disciplines. Prime Minister, the IMF this week released some data effectively showing in us that developed countries are the ones that could be most disrupted when it comes to AI and their workforces. Your own central bank has crunched the numbers and saying AI may replace as many as 4 million or 14% of South Korea's jobs over the next two decades. What is the role of revamping education and training to ensure that you have a workforce that is ready for AI and not disrupted by it? Well, I think still, as he said, the jury is still out mm. whether this kind of speed of AI technology really kicks the people who are working now out of their jobs. There are clearly the increasing productivity will make the economy grow more and not just, you know, changing what they want to do. But still, I think, I, I think it may not be so clear yet that this AI breakthrough will really reduce the number of jobs. If the economy grows, of course, there are some sectoral divergences. But still, if the economy grows more than the, uh, in the situations without AI, still the, the service and goods that will be required with this AI-driven uh, high-tech economy uh, once from our workers and people. So, and also, of course, the AI industry uh, themselves will absorb more people uh, for making the progress in the innovation and things like that. So here, I think we can go into some kind of governance problems here. We should not be in a rush to really would like to restrain the rapid innovations in this AI by too much minimizing the downsides. Still, we think that the jury is out. Still, there are problems, yes, uh, you, know, you know, violating the human rights and things like that. But still, I think that uh, the uh, great 
a great equalizer effect of this AI will be there. So rather than rushing, uh, we should make some delicate balance between our regulations and the innovations that will be allowed with some frame of technology. That will be also discussed at the second safety summit that will be held in Seoul. Ruth, your industry, Silicon Valley, took on a lot of workers around the pandemic. Now we're seeing the layoffs take place. It almost seems at odds with building out an AI workforce, but make some key points here. What is necessary as we think about reskilling around AI? So first, a, a little bit of history on, on jobs and technology change. The history of technology change is that actually more jobs are created than lost. You know, if you go back to the dawn of the Industrial Revolution and the introduction of the automobile, same level of fear. Um, and 500,000 jobs lost, carriage drivers, another 7.5 million created through manufacturing and the supply chain. And you can have story after story like that, which again, go back to my prior point, is important to anchor it in the data but let's talk about if this time is faster, if this time is different, you wanna make sure we're planning for that type of, of, of employment transition and training transition. I think it does go back to your point, which is everything that we do actually anchors back to what is data analytics, how am I, am I digitally savvy? And so at Google, years ago, we started a digital skilling program. And in fact, the impetus for it initially was to provide skilling to people from underserved communities to get into this highest, you know, this fast growing and high paying job sector. It started with IT support and over the years has evolved to include everything like cybersecurity training, data analytics training, and now AI training. And so it becomes part of the skill set. It's like we grew up without calculators. What kid doesn't have a calculator? This is part of the language that you need to know. Our skilling programs can be done with no background in three to six months. And so the view is we need to work with the private sector, the public sector, to continue to offer data that's kind of transition skilling work that's so needed. It's going to be a core part of it, um, in part because of the, the fear of the unknown. And then there's the reality of transitions. And I'll just add one more point. I've done a lot of the reskilling work through the training programs that we have around the globe. And what excites me when I see people going through this is not just that they come out with the skills that are needed, but they every time, anywhere around the globe, say, I now have confidence that I have a role in this future economy. And to us, that's a really important part of it, is ensuring that people embrace what the upside can otherwise be. We've got uh, about two minutes left, so I'm just going to toss around the, the panel the question as to whether AI is going to be a great equaliser at this stage. Yes, no, maybe add some caveats, Secretary General. At this stage, no, but could be in the future <laughs> if we get the governance right. <laughs> Ruth. I'm going to say the same thing, but the flip side, I think it has the potential to, but we've got to get the governance right. Minister. <laughs> it's a question of uh, not if, but when. Mm -hmm. And I think it's definitely down the line going to be the great equalizer. When? In a couple of years. I would project in the next three to five years. Minister. Possible if we make sure that the foundation's access to the compute infrastructure skills is you know, present in all these economies. And Prime Minister. Yes, it'll be an equalizer, but with some caveats. People should be more IT savvy, and we should adjust to the very total transformation in the access to knowledge and information. Yes. We very much appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much, Prime Minister, Minister, Minister Ruth, and Secretary General. I'm going to now toss it over to, to Cathy Lai, who is head of AI Data Metaverse, member of the Executive Committee, World Economic Forum, for some conclusion remarks. Cathy. Thanks, Ka Karen. Everyone can you hear me? Okay, good. Thanks, Karen, and the uh, esteemed uh, panelists for such an uh, insightful panel. Uh, just very quickly, Cathy Lai, head of AI at the Forum. Uh, many of you have been asking what is the forum doing on AI. Some of you have heard of it, but let me just, you know, bear with me. We launched the AI Governance Alliance back in June 2023 with the aim to uh, champion uh, responsible design, development, and deployment of the generative AI um, um, systems. Um, and today we were very proud. We count uh, among 200 organizations and more than 250 individuals as, as our members. 
there are so many things they cannot agree on, from you know, safety guardrails to the applications. But the one thing they all agree on is there's a consensus on there's an urgent need uh, to bridge a uh, digital divide through uh, improving data quality and availability, uh, through uh, adapting uh, uh, the lang language models to the local context, and also providing more talent and training and also SDG uh, applications as well. So that is one thing where we are going to be focusing on in the year of 2024. Uh, on Thursday, we have a press conference where we'll share more, uh, but rest assured, we know that it's a long journey. It's, it's going to take quite some time and effort, but our intention is really to surface solutions and partnerships um, to make sure that AI benefits all. And thanks everyone, and enjoy the rest of your week here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.